Hello, uh, my name's Glenn Jeffrey, and I work at the Institute of Ophthalmology, University College London. And I have a research program where I work on aging and diseases of aging, uh, and including those of the eye and the retina. And that, that accounts for a large proportion of my research activities and the people in my lab. So one of, the, one of the things that really interests me about aging is how we derive energy. Now, how do, you, how do you get that energy to swing your legs out of bed in the morning and stand up? And that's a very, very hot topic in aging now. And I like to think about it in terms of us having batteries. So in our bodies, we've got batteries, and like your car, and they provide the energy that we use to live our lives, to walk down the street. But like car batteries, they run down over time. When you're young, your battery's full. And as we all know, once you get over 40 or 50, the legs don't quite swing out of bed in the same way. And that's just simply because your batteries have run down. Now, that's all right if you live till maybe 50. But then as you get older, we're living much, much longer now than we used to. Think about how old your parents were when they died and how old you are. It's now become a bigger challenge because instead of, you know, by the time we die, our batteries are 20% full. Um, now, as we approach into our 80s and 90s, they are 10% or even less than 10% full. So as with our car battery, they run down, but you're keeping your car longer. And the consequence is the battery just isn't doing it anymore. So biologically, our batteries are called mitochondria. You don't really have to know that, but that's what they are. And there's hundreds of them in each of the cells of our body. As we get older, there are a few. Um, and the retina is really interesting. The retina is really interesting because it's got more mitochondria than any other cell in your body. Now, you'd think, oh, what, 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 what cells do I need energy for? Muscles uh, and my heart muscle, my leg muscles. No, the, 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 you've got more mitochondria in your retina than any other organ in your body. Your retina burns energy at an enormous rate. And the relationship between burning energy and aging is very, very close. So the faster you burn energy, the faster you age. And that becomes a big problem. And when mitochondria really run down, they start to cause disease or become associated with diseases that we know as diseases of aging, such as Parkinson's disease, um, uh, macular degeneration they've all got a relationship with mitochondria and they've all got a relationship with the battery the powerhouse uh, in the cell if mitochondria are truly batteries and i'm using the analogy of them with a car can we recharge the battery and avoid diseases of aging or if not avoid diseases of aging can we slow the pace down of aging and there are whole theories very very well accepted theories of aging based on mitochondria it's called the mitochondrial theory of aging and it's one of the key players in in aging theory so can we do that what is what is the possibility what is the possibility of recharging well in the last 30 years, we learned something new about mitochondria. They react to light. They are very sensitive to light. And certain light, so certain ranges of red light, when given on their own, can recharge mitochondria, allowing them to provide more energy. That's great news. While at the same time, other wavelengths of light, such as blue, drain the battery down really quickly. A bit like you leaving the car headlights on um, and going to bed. Battery gets run down. And that's one of the reasons why, as a society, we're becoming increasingly concerned about blue lights and the problems that they pose for health. So light is a player in mitochondria. Should we be concerned about light? Well, 
things have changed enormously in our world. For millions of years, we evolved under sunlight. And in that sunlight, there was this balance between blue and red, a natural balance. We also, <laughs> we were very sensitive to light because for millions of years, we lived in Africa. And for millions of years, we wandered around naked. So we were very, very exposed to sunlight. We progressed, we moved into houses, but, and we started wearing clothes, but the old style light bulbs that we had, the old tungsten filament light bulbs, they had a very, very similar spectrum to daylight. They had a really nice balance between the blue and the red, but things have changed. We now have completely different light bulbs. First light series of light bulbs we had that were different were those horrible strip lights, just those horrible kind of sharp strip lights. And then after that, we had eco bulbs. And now finally, we have LEDs. The thing about these lights is they produce energy incredibly cheaply, but the balance between the blue and the red has gone. When you look up at an LED light bulb, you think that's a white light bulb. It's actually not. It's got a large amount of blue in it that you can't see with your eyes. And on top of that, the red has been reduced significantly. So we do we have a bit of a problem for the future in terms of what these lights are going to be doing to us over a long period of time. So we did an experiment. And the experiment was, what happens if we take someone whose vision is declining and we give them a burst of red light, which recharges the mitochondria in our eye? Remember, more mitochondria in your retina than any other part of your body. And this is a really little simple experiment. And this is uh, one of the postdocs in our lab, PARDIS. And the device she's holding up in front of her eye is a red light torch, specific wavelength. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the graphs on the right. Going down is good. This is a measure of threshold. So anything that goes down is good and is an improvement. And we asked people to identify letters, as you can see in the middle. And then we made the letters really difficult for you to see. And we found that after we did that, we reduced the threshold for vision, for color vision, by 17% when those colors were bluish and by 12% when those colors were reddish. So we can recharge the battery and we can improve aged vision. Now, I'm going to give you some sideline stories just to give you a bit of a reinforcement in this whole thing. Batteries aging, nasty things happening to you, recharging mitochondria. Okay, we can improve aged vision. But what else can we do? Because mitochondria are everywhere. Well, insecticides that kill bum bumblebees and honeybees do so because they discharge the batteries and they make the bees like park, give them Parkinson's type disease and they don't move. And the consequence is they starve to death. So we used to buy honeybee and um, bumblebee hives and we had them in the lab and we gave them insecticide and we recharged their mitochondrial batteries with red light and the consequence was the bees didn't get parkinson like disease now these uh these red lights are in beehives in about two or three hundred beehives in france and they're protecting bees from stressful situations such as insecticide and bad weather conditions, the things that stress them. Other people have used exactly the same methods for Parkinson's disease and have actually shown that in monkey models of Parkinson's disease, you can avoid about 80% of the symptoms. So it can improve age mobility. Well, we know that because it blocks this Parkinson effect in bees and flies. So if we do this, can we improve, well, we can also improve vision in age models of AMD in mice, but mice aren't humans and they don't have a macula. That's really important to keep in mind. So can we 
translate this to the human. We know also the other thing that we can do is we can reduce the rate of cell death in the retina with these red lights. That means reducing the rate of geographic atrophy. Okay, what else have we got that can give us some confidence in what we're doing in the fact that we are actually improving mitochondria and improving behavior? Here's a nice story. It's a great story. There are children born with mitochondrial disease. This is one of them. And we, the, these children are an active part of our research program because their mitochondria don't work. They can't control the muscles in their body. Their faces become a little distorted and they can't open their eyes properly. They have ptosis. So uh, this little girl, Eva, her parents came to us and asked if they could use red light. And this was an entirely a choice for them. Uh, and Eva, there are dates underneath. After the third photograph, photographs taken each week, Eva started to improve. And you can see by the last photograph on the right that Eva now can open her eyes. And actually, she can walk to school and she can do swimming. She's doing swimming lessons. So we've got three children like this. Um, we're just starting a big grant from the Lilly Foundation. But the important point that I would like to get over to you is that we can improve mitochondrial function. So, of course, the big question for this audience is, can we use red light to improve vision in AMD? Well, we had a clinical trial and we failed. Um, but with everything that doesn't work the first time, you've got to ask why. Why didn't it work? Well, we only had a very, very short time period to do the study, about a year. And as most of you will know, AMD is a long disease. We need to follow you over a long period of time. The second reason why we think it didn't work was because the patient population that we had at Moorfields all had rather well established disease. We didn't grab the patients when they first had their first symptoms of AMD, and that's where we should have got in. So, but not everything is lost. And while we may have failed, um, others are showing some signs of improvement. So uh, Ben Burton, who is a consultant in East Anglia, uh, has been involved in a trial um, where they've been using red light. And very significantly, the patients that he selected have been have had relatively early disease. And he has shown uh, with that team that the rate of geographic atrophy in the eye is reduced didn't stop the disease which i think is a very important point didn't give people back what they'd lost but it was reducing the rate at which cells were dying and we know that that red light can do that it does that in the animal models why did they also succeed they succeeded they had more time they followed patients over a longer period of time and they also had the advantage of commercial funding so there were deep pockets on this one um, that certainly helped so what do you need? What do you need to make all of this work? Well, you've seen this picture here of my postdoc PARDIS and this little torch um, that was constructed. To improve vision, I'm saying improve vision because that's what we've been doing in people, not directly going into AMD subjects. All you basically need is an LED and a power source. And that is essentially it. And there's a lovely little story Patient came in, wanted to be included in a trial. We couldn't. There was a reason we couldn't include her in a trial. And she, she came back a, a month later and she held a battery and she held an LED in her hand. And she joined the two together and she put it in front of her eye and she said, Glenn, will it work? I, I, was, I was completely I was gobsmacked, actually. So we tested, we tested the LED, we tested the battery, and we said, yeah, under the right conditions, that may work, but we didn't recommend that you go about it that way. So let's be a bit more specific for what you need. What are the parameters for this that we all know, all the red light people know are important? Well, funnily enough, it only works in the mornings. But mitochondria don't just do provide energy. You know, mitochondria have got housekeeping. 
they do things like the ironing and the washing and they you know they do all lots of different things and i think in the afternoons that's what they're doing they're not really interested in red light in the afternoons you don't need very much light to do this our exposures where we've improved vision repeatedly have really only used about three minutes longer isn't better this is not like paracetamol two paracetamol are better for a headache than one not in this case the energy levels we use are now very low. They're about the same as the, a red light, um, a bike light, no more. You don't need to do it every day either. I mean, so far in our studies, uh, human studies, we have actually given them, uh, given it twice a week, did exactly the same with the bumblebees, and giving it more often is not better at all. So, so far, we found absolutely no downside. Uh, we've been doing this now for over 10 years uh, and we've been looking for things going wrong and so far we haven't found it. Okay, so my lab has no commercial interests. Um, there are a lot of red light devices out there that you can see on eBay, Amazon, and they're all making, many of them are making probably unreasonable claims. You've got to be very, very careful. The vast majority of these devices are not tested. Uh, they, many of them are probably not safe. They come from overseas. So any legis legislative ability we've got to control them is extremely limited. We've tested two devices. And the reason we've tested them is because I need devices in the lab. And I really don't have time to solder together uh, LEDs and batteries and put them in tubes and all the rest of it. So I went out to find at least two devices that we can use in the lab um, that are safe and do what is said on the packet. So there's two of them, um, iPower, which is a pair of glasses, and iCharger, which is a torch. Uh, the iCharger is what has been used on the children with mitochondrial disease. Um, it is also being used for um, a myopia study and also for a retinitis pigmentosa study. Um, they may be being used for other things. I don't, I'm unaware because I don't have a commercial interest in them. We just tested them to say there are some devices out there that do appear to be safe. Now, yeah, I'm going to carry on looking at devices. Uh, please never go near a device that says laser on it. Um, because they are potentially damaging. And even if you've got a good visual system, you don't want to put light in your eye that isn't safe. Now, many of you, because of you're at this meeting, have retinae that are not in great shape. So you've got to be even more careful. That's really important. And uh, myself and my team are here, and there is my email address on the first slide, and we are committed to answering your questions. Um, it may ruin our weekends, but I think it's really important that you have a question and we try and deal with it. This doesn't solve AMD. It might. Some of these devices may help slow it, but we have to be very, very cautious and we have to keep our expectations relatively low. Thanks very much for your time.